Growing up, you know, I slowly had this process of realizing that all the things around me that people had told me were just the natural way things were, the way things always would be, they weren't natural at all. They were things that could be changed, and they were things that, more importantly, were wrong and should change. After programming prodigy and internet activist Aaron Swartz took his own life in 2013, his death became a symbol of government overreach to his fans across the internet. Swartz was just 26 and was charged by the U.S. Justice Department with wire fraud and violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for illegally downloading millions of academic research articles. The charges carried a maximum penalty of $1 million in fines and 35 years in prison. We sat down with filmmaker Brian Knappenberger, who's made a new documentary about Swartz's life called The Internet's Own Boy. Can you just give us a, just a background about him? Yeah, Aaron Schwartz um, was a sort of child prodigy. Um, you know, his fingerprints are all over the kind of early internet. He sort of took to programming at a very, very young age and was participating in these sort of programming working groups that really kind of facilitated a lot of the, uh, the tools that created the kind of free flow of information on the, on the early internet. So he was um, uh, instrumental in RSS. He was part of an RSS working group. Um, he was uh, the technical architect of Creative Commons. Um, and uh, he was one of the co-founders of Reddit. All these startups say they're going to go and like, change the world. They yeah. want to change the world from the ground up. But Aaron Swartz really did want to change the world through social justice causes. Can you yeah. just talk about that for us? One of the things that's so fascinating about Aaron's story is this kind of decisive turn he took after they sold Reddit. Right after Reddit was sold to Condé Nast, Aaron Swartz became a very rich 19-year-old, um, and he could have easily done what most people do in the Silicon Valley startup world, and that is just go do it again. Instead, he makes this turn towards social organizing, political causes, really understanding that he had a set of skills that he could put in in um, in the service of the public good, and he didn't see a reason if he had those skills that he shouldn't do that. Once I realized that there were real serious problems, fundamental problems that I could do something to address, I didn't see a way to, to forget that. I didn't see a way not to. One of Swartz's biggest successes was killing the Stop Online Piracy Act in 2012. The bill would have expanded the powers of the government to crack down on copyright infringement by cutting back access to sites that traded pirated content. But critics like Swartz said that the way the bill was written would have amounted to censorship of the internet. I remember watching the SOPA protests unfold day by day, you know, over the course of weeks, and just uh, having it go from from just a few people, loud people kind of beating the drum and, and trying, to, trying to get out the word about how bad this was, mm -hmm. to being a massive internet blackout. And a lot of these people were young people. These are people that grew up on the internet. They grew up having email addresses. They grew up writing on Wikipedia. Yeah. They saw their future changing significantly. Yeah, I think SOPA shows that, that, that this, uh, a generation felt very personal about the internet, that it was something that they really cared about, uh, and that they didn't want to see change. They wanted to kind of uh, maintain some of the freedoms of the internet. This is a historic week in internet politics, maybe American politics. The thing that we heard from people in Washington, D.C., from staffers on Capitol Hill was they received more emails and more phone calls on SOPA blackout day than they've ever received about anything. I think that was an extremely exciting moment. This was the moment when the internet had grown up politically. While Swartz enjoyed success with the downfall of SOPA, another one of his social causes brought wrath from the government under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So what Aaron did was he downloaded 4.7 million academic journal articles from the online service JSTOR. And he used MIT's network in order to get to them. Um, why he did that, we don't know. Um, we, we speculate in the film. We give a couple of different possibilities. Uh, I'm not sure anybody really knows. Well, he wasn't going to sell them. I mean, this is a very rich 19-year-old. He didn't yeah. need to sell them. Like, there's, uh, he doesn't need to sell these, I, I believe JSTOR, I don't know how much they charge for articles, but something around 50 bucks or so. Yeah, you know, if you go to the JSTOR or database, I mean, if you, go to, if you go to JSTOR, you could spend a lot of money pretty quickly on <laughs> not very many articles. And these are articles, by the way, that have been paid for, research that's paid for by taxpayers, or research that was already in the public domain. So uh, there's a couple of reasons why you can kind of surmise that he might have been after these articles. Um, the most ludicrous is that he would sell them. I mean, we're talking about the 1860 Journal of Botany or something. We're not talking about something that might have a, a, a big street value, right? A big, a big value. 
But some of the other, uh, I think, more realistic, uh, you know, he, he wrote a lot about um, being upset that taxpayer-funded research wasn't available to everybody, particularly people in the developing world. He saw this as a kind of uh, treasure, a, a, a resource among the greatest minds of our time. Uh, contributing to the greatest problems of our time that should be open. Swartz was charged uh, by the U.S. Justice Department with two counts of wire fraud and 11 violations of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that carried a maximum uh, penalty of a million dollars in fines and 35 years in prison. What do you think that the Justice Department's message to Swartz and hackers like him what was their message? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, the prosecutors told Aaron's father that they needed, uh, they needed someone to make an example out of, uh, that they needed a case for deterrence. And if you look at Aaron's life, uh, like I have, I've just made a film about him, the immediate question is, well, what kind of behavior were they trying to deter? What were they trying to deter? Um, you know, hacking is a very broad, broad, a kind of umbrella term that encompasses all kinds of different kinds of activity. Honestly, the vast majority of what Aaron was doing seemed to me to be political organizing. So what were they trying to deter? What part of the behavior that he was engaged in were they trying to uh, deter? I think it's a really good question. It's a question we don't know the answer to because the case never went to public trial, right? We don't know what, what the government's case would have been in this. The title of the film is The Internet's Own Boy. It comes from somebody who gave you an interview in the film and the last, the second part of that statement is the internet's own boy and the old world killed him. Why did you include that in the film? Well, I think that we're in this period of time in which our lives are changing very rapidly. We know we all live these kind of massively networked lives and we have to figure out how to bring into that, those networked lives these, these things that we care about, presumably, constitutional rights, uh, human rights, those kinds of things. And, um, uh, you know, the, the ability of this free speech, the, the, the protections that we have already in place that protect us from government searches and things like that. We have to figure out how that works in this new uh, world. But there are still very entrenched kind of um, uh, sort of powers that be that, that, that may not be ready for those changes. And so I think that where those kind of tectonic plates are grinding, uh, is is a really interesting part of of our world right now, and I think that's that's essentially what that quote means that the that the old world killed him that that uh, we now live in this new world a, a world in which he was nurtured by these kind of internet luminaries, um, but those traditional forces those traditional kind of entrenched systems uh, just just aren't up uh, up to the times uh, that are that are. You know, he, he was on, Aaron was on the edge, right? He was a little ahead of everybody else. That's just not a comfortable place to be.